Great pleasure to be here. Very grateful to the organizers uh, for the opportunity. Uh, as an evolution biologist with developmental biology training, I'm going to give you a, that perspective. So we, we, we love optometrics. Uh, I cooperate with people who really care about applied mathematics and optometrics. But we use as a tool, uh, combined with other tools, such as phylogenetic analyses and uh, developmental biology analysis, we give approaches to come up with the um, good answers for primarily evolution questions. As um, I mentioned, last year we celebrated a big anniversary for Dr. Thompson's famous book on growth reform. And recently, earlier this year, I gave a talk at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. And I was shown a book uh, which came from his private library. And you can see that this is a book called The Age of Mammals. It was written by Henry Osborne. And on the cover it says, to Darcy Thompson from his friend, um, Henry Osborne, in uh, January 1911. This is several years before he published his growth form. You can see here on um, this illustration of several mammalian skulls, in faint pencil, there are drawings of his famous uh, grids uh, that he was already thinking about transformations. In fact, in his book, he managed to combine both evolutionary analysis within the uh, what we now call the morphous space, but also developmental analysis. How animals change their shape, the biological shapes change during the progeny. And here, and he uh, followed the field of drone biology, biology back then, so closely that he stated that genetic transformations of biological shapes constitute the proof that variation has proceeded on definite and orderly lines, that the comprehensive law of growth, the laws of growth, that is this all the developmental biology machinery that was still very obscure at the time has pervaded the whole structure of the to the point that actually he stated that uh, it is this intrinsic forces which, which were uh, the primary reason for all the diversity. In fact, he gave a talk um, that he never published. Um, Nature gave a commentary on his lecture called Some Difficulties in Darwinism that he gave for the British Association meeting in 1894 where it said, nature said that he, Dr. Thompson, he doubts the efficacy of the struggle for existence in the case of hummingbirds, etc. In this case, he regards the profusion of forms, colors, and other modifications is due merely to laws of growth, and thinks that growth may be more exuberant in the absence of struggle and hardship. That is, you consider natural selection as opposed to generating force, you consider it to be more of an impediment to generating diversity. So the two great uh, evolutionary questions that I'm curious about is what is the words of biology for shape. And obviously, there are two answers. One is the evolutionary history, and the other one is individual development that produces the biology for shape. And the related question is, of course, nothing comes in isolation. There are patterns, very complex patterns of diversity that you see in this, for example, beautiful heads, very highly adaptive uh, in birds that we also need to explain. And um, much of what you see, in, for example, in birds, but also in mammals, flower and plants, many other organisms, is generated, this diversity, by what we call adaptive radiations. So adaptive radiation is the rapid evolution of morphologically and ecologically diverse species from a single ancestor. It usually implies two coincidental processes. Multiplication of species number, which is referred to as species richness, and increased phenotypic disparity, which is referred to as uh, known as morphological diversification. So two processes happen at the same time. And such evolutionary success is often attributed to a key innovation, which uh, is a novel breakthrough trait or set of traits that promotes speciation and diversification of a whole taxon or a group of related species. So this is an important um, terms that we'll be uh, dealing with in my presentation. And the classical examples of adaptive radiations are Darwin's finches in Galapagos, the Hawaiian hunting in Hawaii, and the fall stomach bats in the Caribbean islands that we uh, also study in our projects. So the several questions that I'll try to answer what is the first one is what is the interplay between developmental morphogenesis and evolution evolution and diversification? Question number two is what is relative, uh, relatively more important as a generative force for adaptive radiations? That is environmental conditions, as is often postulated, or developmental genetic changes. And question number three is if developmental changes are key, if they are indeed important, what is the nature of genetic alterations that are driving morphological evolution? So this is a textbook example of adaptive radiation. This is Darwin's finches, which evolved from a single species, which land Galapagos, and then uh, diversified so that every single species here has a different type, because every single species has a distinct 
big in terms of size and or shape. These are known to be used as tools uh, for different purposes. The ground finches, which are very deep in broad bills, like use them to crack seeds. The cactus finches have this way pointed bill, which, is the, which, uh, which they use them to penetrate into the cactus flowers of, uh, or fruit. The vegetarian finches, they have very deep but very narrow bills, which they use sort of like garden shears to cut young leaves and eat them. And woodpecker finch, for example, this is just examples out of about 18 species. As the name suggests, it goes around woodpecking on the bark, and then if it finds a, 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 a larvae deep in the hole, it will famously make a tool from a little twig and pick it up and eat it. So one of the early things we did, um, in collaboration with Michael Brennan here at Harvard, um, we wanted to apply the F1 transformations to see how the beaks from the two-dimensional shapes, looking from the side, relate to each other using F1 transformations, which were so, uh, so daring to... Uh, to Darcy Thompson himself, because he believed that those F1 transformations such as scaling or shear, rotation and so forth, they could explain a lot of the uh, a lot of the biological shapes. And indeed we found that if you look at all the species of Darwin's species bills, we can group them into, by just applying scaling, we can uh, collapse them into three distinct mathematic group shapes, which is which we named group A, which included all the just seasons. That is, all the species here, even though some of them are longer, some of them are broader and deeper, they all collapse by scaling alone into the same shape, the same curve. Uh, whereas the tree finches, for example, warbler finches, they, uh, by, after scaling, they collapse into their own distinct shape, and a uh, vegetarian finch would not collapse into, uh, under, uh, under shearing into any other group shape, and it would require shear on top of that to be able to transform all of these, collapse them all into a single shape. Suggesting that this is kind of two tier variation, because these are the somewhat hierarchical transformations, explain the entire variation of big shapes that you see in Darwin's finches. In fact, since then, we expanded this analysis to many other songbirds. We've now looked at multiple families of songbirds, and we showed that the same two tier variation explains, uh, it continues to explain their diversity. Okay, can I ask a question yes. again? Why do you only look at the upper part? Yeah. Uh, the upper part here is uh, functionally and uh, is, is more important. So in birds, unlike uh, mammals, the upper, peak, upper part of the beak is movable. There's a normal joint here. So the way how for example, they crack a seed, they put a seed on the lower jaw, and they use muscles which close the upper jaw to crack it. So the exact shape of the upper bill is functionally um, very important. Another uh, thing is that the upper and lower jaws, they have the developmentally independent. So uh, this the shape of the upper bill is developmentally regulated, and it's completely established by the end of the end of the genesis. Whereas the lower bee continues to develop after hatching, and it has its own dynamic. So it's something that would be really interesting to look at. Uh, but it is, yeah. So it's functionally not as important, and developmentally it's different. So if you turn the question around and try to collapse the lower beak, you obviously going to get something very different because you don't see that collapse in the upper one. And you're saying that's a consequence of different developmental times or de developmental programs? Or so we looked at the adult shapes only, so that we haven't actually tried that. So it would be interesting to see the upper and lower beaks, they come to match. Uh, Even though they the develop species. separately. Exactly. So the, so the, the, the coupling in shape, they, they match tip to tip, is not due to shared development, but because of functional, functional constraints. Uh, but it, it's an interesting question whether it, it seems to be, it, it, it's, in most birds it's rather flat, kind of it serves more as a support, and it's the upper beak which tends to have much more <coughs> geometry to it. Okay. And, and again, the, the finite element analysis which also show exactly how, for example, different curvatures of the beak are important for dissipating stress that emanates from, for example, cracking the beak or, you know, or, so, uh, or getting into the flower. Can I just go back to the yeah. previous slide? So, you have these uh, curves, and you're trying to find the affine transformation and minimizing this normal energy between them. That's the goal? That's and, right. and then cluster them, whatever resulting distance. Yes, so there was parameterization, basically, uh, point to point, looking at how they would collect, whether they collapse up in just using scaling alone. OK. And, and what was the conclusion that by doing affine as opposed to just doing the no sharing, the scaling. Here you have here you have more clusters and less clusters here. Yeah. So uh, what tends to be happening, uh, and this is also true in other members of the same family, other families, is that there are groups of species. Some of them are small, some of them are very large, and you put dozens of species, among which all the members, despite having adapted to different peaks, 
different species of GSP that are like Pactus Finch and the Ground Finch, they actually have functionally very different peaks. They are apparently scaling scale variants of the same, fundamentally the same peak. But uh, it also, um, what it also says is that there is a more rare, because there, there, are, far more, there are far fewer groups of group shapes than species for the songbirds. Uh, that uh, this kind of transformation, which may require its own distinct developmental mechanism to uh, to do this transformation, that is also needed to produce kind of new. Um, so this is particularly referring to the curvature. So this is about scaling, whereas yeah. the distinct curvature of the peak uh, follows. Uh, it requires shear in order to to collapse them with other members. So then it can may apply its own mechanism. Uh, so what I will be Telling most about it's about actually scaling. We understand it's called, called mental regulation much better than, than, than shear. The, um, the big shape in Darwin's which is particularly the upper bill shape, is known to be developmental regulated. They actually hatch with the right peaks on them. This is from the Athenians and the Grants work. And if you look at development, this is still several days before hatching, you can see that the cactus finch is developing this pointy bills, whereas the ground finch is developing this curved, uh, very uh, deep and broad bills. Uh, we, work, we uh, looked at the um, somber peak development, and when they start, it's a very... Yes. So if, I, if I remember right, I mean, in your paper, one way of thinking about the shearing and, is how many degrees of freedom do you need, right? And then once you have those degrees of freedom, those are variables then you can relate back to gene expression or whatever you're interested in, right? Exactly. And so... Yeah. How do you, like, let's say someone just gave you start said, okay, I don't care about peaks anymore, I want to think about jaws or something else. How do you think about deciding what are going to be these degrees of freedom, or is there like a checklist that I go through? First I look at scaling, then shearing, and then, right, how, how, do, I, how do I do that in my head? Um, a good question. To me as a biologist, it's striking that when you actually read that Spencer's book, is that most of the examples are of scaling variety, which apparently is mathematically simpler to, to achieve. And then you have shear, and then you have kind of some other nonlinear transformations, and those tend to be more and more rare. Um, so that is to say that there are some uh, mathematically and perhaps biologically kind of more obvious solutions uh, to the problem. For example, with just Pisa, all the peaks that they have within that, that large genus are all adaptive. Again, every single species has a different diet, but they are all scaled versions of the same peak. So that that um, kind of that transformation is readily available, uh, and you see actually sometimes a very large clade, um, a, a, a whole large genus, which, uh, which is just scaling peaks in different uh, in different ways uh, without changing fundamental curvature. So so that suggests that. Um, this one, and whereas the shear transformation does may require a more complex mechanism. Uh, for example, uh, modeling suggests that, and kind of, uh, analysis suggests that instead of using this um, uh, diffusion molecules, uh, such as before that I'll be showing, a couple of slides, it, it may require, for example, cell degree polarity control, how the cells divide as the grows, and that generates a bias to the grow zone and creates curvature. So going back to the mechanism, how the peak actually grows, uh, if you look at the early, remember you see this bump on the face, uh, and it has a very large group of polyphenic cells here, the grow zone. And as the time goes on, as the peak increases in size, the grow zone relative to, its, uh, to the size of the peak begins to collapse. It's, there's actually a constant decay rate. At some point, it decays into nothing, <coughs> creating a tip. And therefore, the overall shape of the bill is actually the envelope of all the uh, shapes of the growth zones, which existed in development peak over a pandemic time, that was that is also possible to model. So that, again, this was done in collaboration by Mike Brenner. And um, we first concluded by looking at the all the available in this uh, this database now has grown, uh, looking at the available big shapes that we managed to capture uh, from two-dimensional perspectives, that all of them appear to be um, conic sections of a particular type of parabolic cone. And if we are to uh, allow for, um, so, and this for this, the idea was to solve this so that it would allow for scaling collapse between close relative, shearing collapse and everybody else. It's important to remember also um, that as the peak grows, it continues to scale uh, on, on itself. It's wild, it's So can, can, can I ask yeah. a question? This assumes it's 2D, but the real peak is three-dimensional. So yes. 
I don't understand. Right. Um, the, yes, and, and, and we, right, it, we, we actually like now looking at three-dimensional perspective. The idea was first to um, to look at because the two, the first two dimensions, the length and the curvature. So, well, the length, the depth, and the curvature seem to be quite fundamental to the function of the peak itself. So, the width is obviously very important. And again, we now have three-dimensional sections, uh, so three-dimensional uh, scans that allow us. This. this was a you know quick way to test whether. Some of those ideas that were proposed a long time ago in terms of how, you know, so what's the nature of uh, change that underlies this diversity to test that quickly. So, so this was the, the essential beginning of that, you know, of that modeling. And in three dimensions, what does it look like? Is it is it more like a conical wedge, which is essentially? Yeah, so it looks like it's a. Um, they, they appear to be section cones, uh, section parabolic cones. The simplest ones are fairly straight, simple cones. Um, it's, it's, if you actually look at a lot of, um, you know, grass eaters, they have a fairly simple conical shaped cone. But, so as they begin to specialize, for example, cracking tolerant seeds, they begin to uh, become more, um, kind of more concave. But this is, you know, it's, um, this has modification to the originally simple conical, fairly conical shape deal. Um, so. If you actually look at the mechanisms that control the uh, shape of the bill, we found that early on it's all built of cartilage, uh, which is controlled by molecules like DP4 and Kalmodelin. DP4 primarily controls the depth and the width of the bill. Kalmodelin controls the length of the bill. Again, uh, controlling the cartilage elements, which is then later surrounded and functionally replaced by bone, which is regulated by its own set of molecules, which are functional later in development. And because all these molecules have differential effects on different uh, different axes in the development peak, that allows you to see um, if you can begin to combine these developmental modules with the molecular ones, that allows you to explain with more and more accuracy the resulting di diversity. Um, how they work the before is a molecule which is expressed, we found that it was expressed earlier, and stronger levels in the ground pitches, which have these bone pitch bills. And in fact, if you mimic this, change uh, in the chicken number development, which normally has uh, kind of a, a rather pointy bill. As you increase the amount of um, and timing, which you expressed earlier and stronger levels than before, you tend to produce deeper and wider bills. In the end, it's basically mimicking something like the, what's the medium ground finch to a large ground finch would have this very, very deep, very, very broad bills. And because of different pathways, such as being before and comodeling, Again, in, in, in the ancestral shape, which is small symmetrical bill, they express in fairly low levels. And because they don't regulate each other, it allows you to have two dials in a kind of simplified system, where if you just dial up the P4 levels, you'll produce something that's relatively deep and relatively blunt. Whereas if you upregulate to modeling independently, you will produce a bill which, is, which has the same depth, but it, it's elongated. And of course, if you dial both of them, in different ways, you can produce something uh, which is uh, a bit more in between. So one challenge was to try to explain how this a group of birds, which is using the same spectral genes, that is the genes which control scale genesis, genes for bone and cartilage, which are um, essentially shared between all these species, and the same regular genes, genes that being performed by modeling, they found in all these species as well, how they generate diversity. And the best analogy I could find use architecture when you use the same building materials, such as um, wood and bricks and cement, they use the same tools, but yet they produce very different looking buildings. And of course, it's all about when and where and how you use these tools, the blueprint that explains this diversity. And that's precisely what we're looking for. It's really how we use developmental genes, regulatory genes, that explains this diversity. Another related question is, if we follow the same architectural analogy, so why there are some plates which are much more diverse than other plates? In other words, why are Darwin's finches so diverse? If you look at the, if you read the description of the Darwin's finches in Voyage of the Beagle, which was written 20 years before the original species, he, uh, he writes about this uh, Galapagos finches, that these birds are the most singular of any in the archipelago. And he was onto something. In fact, I will I'll hopefully show you just how special they are among uh, other birds. So if you look at Darwin's finches, and um, I also have some, uh, they're part of a larger plate which has also diverse uh, relatives in the Caribbean. If you compare the diversity with diversity of another group which landed on Galapagos, this is the mockingbirds, the, this is the Galapagos mockingbird species, the related Caribbean species, 
you'll find that there's a dramatic difference in, in diversity. So this species here generated, um, there are multiple species here with different uh, peak morphologies and different diets, whereas the four species here, which inhabit main some of the small islands, uh, mocking birds, Galapagos mocking birds, they have very similar morphology and solid differences in food. So the classical canonical adaptations explanation for this kind of radiation, which was developed by George Simpson in uh, 1953, involves simultaneous divergence of multiple lineages as a consequence of entering new adaptive zones. So the ancestor comes to this empty Galapagos Islands, which presents um, this archaeological opportunities, and this creates a selection for new forms, and, and again, because of island hopping and, and subsequent isolation, these vulnerable the species. Um, so, in fact, this is exactly what uh, was suggested by um, Kevin Burns, who studied the phylogeny of this plate. That one possibility is that since many of the species are island taxa, there may have been strong selection by different types of these birds colonized new islands with the conditions. There's a problem with this argument because if you actually look at the history of these islands, the island species were not the only ones, were not even the first ones, who settled the Galapagos. So, this is two recent papers which put Darren Finch, this is a uh, million years ago. So, the mockingbirds, for example, arrived according to, to this finding, right, about a million years earlier, Darren's finches. Many of the birds settled Galapagos. Many of them actually never even evolved endemic species. Some of them evolved just a single endemic species, like the, the uh, Galapagos flycatchers. The Galapagos mockingbirds are the closest. This is the only other radiation. They evolved four very similar species. <coughs> Unlike the Darren's finches, which just exploded, especially in more recent times. So there's very something you know, interesting going on. If you look at history of colonization, there were there are 28 endemic species and six endemic subspecies on the Galapagos uh, archipelago, which evolved from 18 different ancestral bird invasions that colonized the islands for the past five million years. So there's only one place where all of them have the same opportunities as on the birds if I ran the image earlier. Especially the last, uh, last this is important because um, most of the speciation for downward finches occurred in the last million years when all of this colonies were in place. Same space, same time, same opportunities. The only clay which to, to eventually them was the Darwin's finches. So we're using a phylogenetic method. So this is a um, Bayesian um, algorithm of, um, which allows us, this is a novel one which was um, recently developed for looking at really adaptive relations of flowering plants by our colleagues in Zurich, which allows us to detect the rate shifts in speciation morphological diversification. It allows us to test relative significance of intrinsic, that is morphogenetic versus intrinsic environmental factors. Allows it to identify triggers and modifiers um, of evolution radiations. We also have a very, li very large database um, in collaboration with Gavin Thomas and Joe Tobias. Uh, this every database covers all the passerines. It includes nine morphological traits for all the species, that is, different parameters of the beak, length, width, and depth, etc., wing, leg, body parameters, and 60 environmental factors such as diet, habitat, territoriality, insularity, and so forth. That allows us to test, again, what are the important factors environmental or intrinsic that may be driving this uh, adaptive radiations. So the first step in our analysis is to analyze a family which includes Darwin's finches, it's called Trogidae, or Tanagers. Uh, this family is about 400 species strong, it's the second largest avian family, and so to be one of the most diverse in, in all birds. And next we will, once we um, develop all of our methods and, and include them, we will scale it up to include the entire water passive form, all the passerines, all the songbirds, which with about 6,000 species. So if you just look at the um, tanagers, again, tanagers is a very large family, you will see that this is looking at speciation rates. So the warmer colors suggest you know, very high speciation rates. You can see that there was a lot of speciation early on, and it pulls off for most of the species. There is a very steady state speciation rate. So two groups. Um, you know. So one of them is the Darren's finches, and you can see warmer colors for the relatives in the Caribbean as well. Another one which has even more number of species is the sporophylla or the seed eaters, which live in mainland Central and South America. So these two, these, there are two radiations here. One is adaptive, highly morphologically diverse, you know, this is the species and the relatives in the Caribbean. Another one is not adaptive, that is, they, they produce many species, they're distinct from each other, but they, in terms of plumage, but they have very, very similar bills and very, very similar diets. Another question we can ask using that massive database is phylogenetically, is what are the morphological yeah. are, are finches close enough to each other that you could try to apply quantitative genetic approaches to get additive genetic variance, covariance matrices, to get biotrophy, or try to get estimates of heritability, or are they 
just too far apart that you can't apply those methods? Um, some of them are close natural habitats, and in fact, they're natural cohabitats. Some of them have been, have been sequenced and analyzed. For example, our colleague at the University of Cincinnati, Ken Petri, is doing exactly that. He's applying some of the kind of genetic mapping techniques on, on that. Um, uh, others are too far, and for those, we, we're collaborating with Leif Anderson um, at Uppsala, who is doing a lot of sequencing, genomic sequencing, he sequenced all the species, and he's looking for signatures of selection, and looking for other evidence for the morphology of morphology that take changes. Whatever he generates, we study, whatever we, uh, uh, kind of, tendencies we have, he also looks at that as well. So. Sorry, can you yeah. go back one slide yeah. to... This one? So when you say adaptive versus not adaptive, so you're saying that the seed eaters, that's not adaptive? So these birds are, they have the same diet throughout their multiple ranges. So they, they're all seed eaters, they're all feeding on rat seeds. Um, there is a particular uh, clade within them, which uh, evolved just kind of to feed on larger seeds, but that's pretty much kind of it. So, so they are, um, in fact, I won't have time to get into this, but there is a reason to believe that it's driven by sexual, increased sexual selection. But it's not driven by the same, you know, definitely not, you know, the outcome is clearly not the same as for Darwin's finches, despite having fewer species that are much more diverse, as I will show you exactly, you know, within the same morphous space. So this kind of analysis allows it allows, allows us to compare different morphological traits, for example, the tarsus length, which is the leg, uh, leg length, the, kind of the, the wing, within the wing, within the tail, um, to see how within this large family, how this changed. The, the color change indicates that there was a kind of major shift in in, uh, in this parameter, the legs became shorter, for example, the tail became longer. These little circles indicate, large and small circles indicate uh, the, the intensity of the change. Uh, as a rule, you see the change is happening earlier in evolution, and then uh, things just quiet down and cool off. So you see the entire plates inheriting sometimes a major change which occurred early in evolution. So this is true uh, for all the parameters except one, which is, which is the beak. So if you look at the beak, Again, for all the species outside, there are finches, which, are, which is a small clade right here. There's a change early on, and then it falls off and it stops changing. In the finches, there's a lot of happening right there, because it's happening so recently that you need to zoom in to be able to see what's happening there. So this is the finches. Uh, the tail change occurred last time before in the last common ancestor, but the changes in different primates of the beak, the beak depth, for example, the beak length, the beak width are happening. You know, there are rapid changes happening in closer related species. So the, the intensity and the, um, uh, the, the rapidity of which it's occurring is, is, uh, yeah, is, um, is extremely high. There was a paper published last year by Kevin Thomas's group when they looked at the surface markers, the scan, uh, the bill, uh, the bills in the museum, in all the birds. And they looked at the um, diversification of bill shapes, again, looking at the, the bill surface across all birds. You can see that. There was a period of it more recently, it just when it was quiet, and then it went to overdrive. There was a huge amount of diversification early on, and then it cools off to the point that actually, you know, in all this lineages, one after another, including songbirds, which are right here, it becomes very, very steady state. There are exceptions, and these are the exceptions that I'm really, really curious about. Let's look at our finches within there. Uh, this is the morphous space, looking at multiple big parameters. Um, in blue is the whole family of tanagers. Uh, in here, in this is the Darwin's finches, which occupy, you know, which are this are the seed eaters, which occupy a portion of it, but a little bit to the side, which will become important. In the next slide, this is the echo uh, PCA, ecological PCA. This is the different diets in which they feed as a group. This is uh, all the uh, all the tanagers feeding on all sorts of different food, uh, food types: the, the nectar and the insects and vertebrates. Um, fruit, leaves, and seeds, and you can see that Darwin's finches as a group managed to occupy most of that. Most of what tanagers eat, they eat. And the reason for that is because despite the fact that the diversification did not occur, did not fill out yet at least all the morphospace, space, the epicenter of all these changes in terms of the peak length, in terms of the width and depth, is apparently happening basically changing the bill in all directions towards the <coughs> increase in the depth, some of them increase in the width, the width and so forth. And and this is what allows them to diversify so that they occupy most of the ecological uh, space that the, this entire family evolved to occupy. So if you compare this with the Galapagos mockingbirds, again, the only other um, radiation on Galapagos, you see something very, very different. So Darwin's species came from a very diverse group on the Caribbean, and they managed to essentially regenerate much of the diversity on Galapagos. Galapagos mockingbirds came from a relatively diverse group called Nimiri, which includes mockingbirds um, and mainland. And they evolved 
they changed. They clearly adapted to Galapagos conditions, but they changed, they, but they did not diversify to the point, the same point, in terms of speciation rates, Darwin species clearly increased speciation rates uh, uh, quite strongly. This is them showing uh, within the tropidae. Whereas this entire family of midae, uh, this uh, mockingbirds, and you see that the Galapagos mockingbirds, they did not change their speciation rates. In fact, if anything, they actually did actually decline since they arrived to Galapagos. So the alternative hypothesis that explains that sort of um, pattern is that it's a more structural interpretation, is that the ancestor of all these birds possessed a developmental genetic architecture passed on to its descendants that included a greater variety of regulatory genes controlling nascent cranial development. There is, there is um, an innovation of the development genetic level, something that allows them to produce more, uh, more cranial variation. If you look at the phylogeny of Darwin's species, as I mentioned, they have relatives elsewhere. Many of the species live in the Caribbean, and in fact, Beak morphology begins to change back in the Caribbean. So, again, if you time it, if you time where the changes are occurring in different primates to build, they actually are occurring when, uh, in, in Darwin's species, and they're close and diverse uh, relatives in the Caribbean. And if you look at the beak, um, the, the, morphology, the, the program that controls beak morphology, we see that, uh, as I um, showed you earlier, Darwin's species are employing cartilage uh, controlling bone early on, and then you have bone. They have a set of genes that follow bone development. And that's exactly what we're detecting in some of the species in this uh, sister clay, which is showing deep diversification on the Caribbean. Whereas if you actually look at the more basal species within the same clay, you see that they actually deployed a much simpler program that appears to be kind of, um, not as modular and not as complex as the one employed by Darwin's finches, suggesting that perhaps somewhere here, back in the Caribbean, they invented this program that, uh, this more modular, this more complex program that allows for generate, generation of this uh, big uh, diversity that you see that was and their close relatives. So this refers to this concept of evolvability, that, which is the genetic and developmental properties of members of a species that determine the likelihood that it will undergo the evolutionary change, the capacity to produce radiation. All right. Yes. If I suppose that it's not only the big that changes. They get to a different gut adaptation than if they eat uh, leaves. No. So, so that means that you need, I mean, you put the, either the. So that's the complex that change, right? Yeah. Yeah, so I uh, completely agree. Another thing which changes necessarily when you develop this very special diet. Repeat, repeat the question. Oh, well, the question was that, you know, the, the big changes. This should not be enough because, for example, if you switch from the insect diet to a diet of seeds, you have to change, for example, your physiology, right? So you have to adapt to this new diet as well. And in fact, another thing which changes very really readily when you, you during these transitions is your behavior, because the behavior of a bird which is feeding on the nectar versus the one which is catching flying insects is very, very different. And this kind of evolution between the hardware and software is something that has to be occurring at the same time. In fact, we're very curious about it. Um, there is a growing number of genes. Uh, behavioral genes for which the alleles have been mapped that show uh, that they correlate with particular types of behavior, like novelty seeking, feeding behaviors, migration, migratory behaviors, and so forth, that would also be worth looking at. Uh, but if at least uh, those major morphological um, factors, uh, morphological traits we looked at, such as the, the, the body weight and the wings and the legs and the tail, none of them uh, seem to be changing in correlation with this. Um, Increased spatiation rate specifically down as finches. The only one we've detected so far were these different parameters of the deep shape that were changing very rapidly and, kind of, and, 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 uh, and um, the aptitude, aptitude of change was also very great. But uh, no, you know, no doubt there, is, there are also other changes uh, which must be kind of, uh, happening at the same time, uh, just not as visible. So, what we're doing right now, we are um, looking at uh, um, RNA-seq data from, uh, from multiple stages to multiple species. For example, already detecting transcripts which are seem to be clustering according to what, you know, this, uh, previously defined group shapes, uh, which are defined by different curvatures. The idea is to look for genes which are upregulated and downregulated in specific uh, species or specific specific group shapes, um, going by size, going by curvature, going by length, for example. Uh, then we can validate this by uh, doing QTRT PCR, for example, can this kind of gene which is upregulated in group C, the deterrent finches. Here's another one which is upregulated pretty strongly in group A and so forth. Um, 
the main goal here is to build a regulatory network of genes, um, which is shown here on the construction, which includes some of the uh, genes, the key keynotes, which were already previously found, some of the new key genes, which we're now validating to be expressed in the right place, the right time, and to be relevant, and all those genes which appear to be changing in some species, but not others. And the idea is to define this regulatory network of genes, which could control diverse big shapes and diverse finches, and perhaps in their close relatives, and see, go back to Caribbean, and, see, and, and just try to phylogenetic sample the relatives to understand how this network emerged, whether they actually appear. We were pretty sure that it, it happened within the plate, uh, but back in the Caribbean, whether it emerged piecemeal or it emerged all at the same time, how regulatory interactions changed to allow for this network, we don't know, but this is something that would be really curious to find out. And the next thing to do also would be to scale up this analysis to include all the pass rates. So this is a preliminary analysis where we look at the speciation rate shifts across all the pass rates, six other species, and you see that same picture that you see this uh, massive shifts early on, and then for most species it tends to pull off and turn blue. There are several exceptions, in fact there are about seven, six to seven uh, recent groups like Darwin's finches, and this is uh, sport the last few years, but also um, groups like reed warblers, uh, here's the corvids, corvids the, uh, the ground tyrants. There are several groups, primarily mainland, groups which are um, primarily non dutch radiation, such as the Zostrops, the wide eyes, which occupy many islands across the Indian Ocean, Africa, and you know, all the way to Indonesia, which all eat the same diet, they look very similar to each other, yet they are so many species because they manage to spread out over huge geographic distances. Um, so that's, that's something that we'd like to understand more, both groups like Darwin's finches, groups like Hawaiian honeycreepers, which are very diverse, but also groups which are like Zostrops, which are very specific species reach, but not very diverse. So this shows here the island species, um, white eyes and the Darwin's finches, in green are the mainland groups, which are showing a very rapid increase in change changes in speciation rates. So just for comparisons, this is a steady state speciation rate across passwords. And you see that, for example, with Ostrops, uh, uh, it changed dramatically over the last seven million years and stays very high. For Darwin's finches, it's, you know, it's still growing. It's very, very rapid and it's growing. And other groups show very, very high levels of speciation rates as well. Another example, another textbook example of adaptive radiation is the Hawaiian honeybeepers. That's an older radiation, which evolved from a small finch, which arrived from, uh, from Asia, and evolved to become insectivores. Uh, some of them are catching insects, uh, maybe we can put, uh, put them under the leaves. Others are uh, creepers, they strip bark to find insects. Nectar feeders, uh, generally, and support very uh, high diversity. This is a molecular tree. It shows that they evolved from rose finch-like birds from mainland Asia, and then some of the basal species are still finches in Hawaii. And they evolved perhaps independently several times to become, most of them are creepers, and uh, but some of them became honey creepers, and they evolved these beautiful beaks and this uh, very interesting shaped skulls, which allowed them to get into the, cup, uh, into the flowers and to feed the nectar. Same interesting story. There are 25 bird colonization events on Hawaii over the last 10 million years. Out of 71 endemic bird species which are known to have existed in Hawaii, 42 are species of just this one clay, Hawaiian honey creepers. So there were uh, many, many opportunities, many invaders, and only one clay that took advantage of these conditions. The only other clay that managed to produce any kind of radiation are the so-called Hawaiian thrushes, which arrived there about the same time. They evolved into five species, one of them is now extinct. So it doesn't compare to what you see in Darwin's trenches. However, Hawaiian honeybees do compare in terms of species richness and diversification to Darwin's trenches. The idea, so we're hoping to compare them within the same morphous space see how they compare, um, how the diversity compares um, within the same morphous space. So what we've done, we generate speed scans for all the species of Darwin's finches and the relatives, Hawaiian honeybees and the relatives, and we put landmarks um, around the skull, which also represent interesting functional, um, potential functional mo modules. And the idea was to compare them against each other and compare them against this um, outgroup species. And here is the uh, morphous space. This is the outgroup and more basal species which occupy this kind of <laughs> part of the morphous space, Darwin's finch is clearly more diverse, more many directions, but it's Hawaiian honey creepers, which not only match Darwin's finches, uh, but also evolve this, because they have this very long, uh, this unusual skulls for nectar feeding, they, they evolve to occupy new parts of the morphous space. Another thing which we did, we looked at the, um, how there's different parts of the skull, how there's different modules, 
covariate. So this is table which shows the degree of covariation between shape transformation of the whole skull and each of its function subdivisions. So the idea is to see how integrated the different units are. And Darren's just will see that some of them you know, highly integrate with the rest of the skull, others are less so. In Heine Gilbert's, we found exceptional low levels for some units of, um, of integration, therefore increased modularity, suggesting that the reason why they're even more diverse than Darren's species themselves is because the strength of the interactions. We don't even know the whole mechanism so far, how skull integration occurs in the first place, but this integration is lessened and modularity is increased, therefore perhaps allowing them to, um, to, to produce more variation uh, in the skull as a whole, um, not just the beak. So the conclusion, conclusions from the BIRD project so far is that there are several clades of passerids which show recent rapid increase in speciation rate. A minority of these are island taxa. And Darwin's finches and close related close piece of this of the relatives from the Caribbean show exceptional levels of both morphological <coughs> cranial diversity and speciation rates. And this phenomenon is not easily explained by the imperial adaptations for explanations and may therefore require a more structuralist approach. And we're now exploring the relative roles of both extrinsic, that is ecological, and intrinsic morphogenetic factors using a combination of phylogenetic, morphometric, and dual biology methods. An analysis suggests that an intrinsic innovation at the level of craniofacial development program is what likely increased the vulnerability of the uh, clade of Telespisa and fuel their morphological diversification. So these are our bird projects. And in fact, it is this kind of thinking that, remember, uh, made Dr. Thompson somewhat of a prime in the, in the, in the uh, um, uh, evolutionary committee, he actually writes here, he comes on his own work, I have tried to make this it, as little contentious as possible. That is to say, where I, I, it undoubtedly runs counter to the convention Darwinism, I do not drop this in, but leave the reader to draw the most obvious world for himself. The very last example that I'll mention just um, on a couple of slides is a completely different group of animals. These are mammals. You can see that Here's the reason why we're really interested in them. They're incredibly diverse. These are leaf nosed bats from the New World called Polystomini. They have huge diversity of faces. They have many species, again, living primarily in the Caribbean islands. This diversity is maintained by differences in skeleton, cranial skeleton. So they evolve from insect feeders. They, these uh, animals here feed on fruit. They have very primate like skulls. These animals here really have very elegant skulls and snouts. They feed on nectar. Here is a flying carnival, which feeds on rodents and has this very wolf-like skull. And here is a huge skull for the vampire bat, which has this the middle of the skull collapses here, so that the incisors are now pointed uh, a bit more forward uh, for uh, drilling, drilling the skin and it has very unusual, uh, unusual skull shape. We know from phylogenetic work that uh, basal members of this group, like Macorus, for example, they are still insect feeders, which fly around and catch insects by collocation. And within this group, they evolved many different diets. Nectar feeders evolved perhaps at least twice. Uh, uh, some of them evolved to the feed of vertebrates, fruit, blood. So same here. So we wanted to understand using morphometry first what, uh, uh, so what are the diversity patterns that the birds are produced over time. So we uh, did CT scans of multiple species, uh, put landmarks on external and internal features. Here's the morphospace, space, which represents dimensional skull shape. These are the arm groups. This is the calculated last common ancestor. And you can see how the kind of burst like radiation literally goes in all directions towards food eating bats. This is the vampire bat. That's the bat which feeds the rodents. This are the two branches going towards the uh, two villages which are now feeding a nectar. Because we can uh, also collect temperatures, we can look at the skulls as soon as they form, and you can put the same landmarks on the developing skulls. We can look at the trajectories. This is the trajectories. Um, trajectories, this is the more basal species, fairly short, and you can see that some species, they change the angle at which they develop, other species you know, develop for much longer. Why is it important? Well, it's because actually next year, we'll be celebrating another anniversary for this important paper in the medieval um, world, a size and shape in a collagen and phylogeny, wrote, uh, written by Pierre Albert uh, and David Wake, where they, for the first time, defined the compare on the genetic trajectories of different species, they define, for example, heterochrony. So they find, they, they, this are the two modes shown here. This is the um, ancestral line, that's the hypermorphosis, hypermorphic line, where the, the, the descendant extends development. This one is acceleration, where the, the descendant changes the rate 
at which it develops. And that's exactly what we see in these bats. Here's an example of acceleration. That's the basal bat which shows the more ancestral autogeny. That's the more derived bat which shows acceleration. This is the, again, very short trajectory for the, this is the adult for the more basal species, and these are the extended hypermorphic trajectories for the more derived species. <coughs> we also see that the changes that you see in during evolution, for example, this are the um, nectar feeding bats, where the, the skull becomes more extended relative to the ancestor shown in green, or the skull completely changes the shape in the vampire bats. It's matched very closely by the changes that you see in ontology. So that's my very last data slide. So the, the idea again is I believe that this group is unusual as well. Um, the Caribbean islands are occupied by members of seven other families of, of bats, not just by the so there's something very unusual about this group of bats as well, and perhaps whatever we find that regulates penetration development and diversity in these bats will be something that's, that will be a novelty for, the, for this group as well. So here I'd like to stop uh, and thank the members of my group who were, whose work I particularly um, discussed today. Uh, Jasmine, who is studying the phallostomic bats, Ashley Rini, who is uh, doing a lot of photogenic analysis, uh, these are PG students, uh, Pozo, Maria Dobrova, who is doing the Molecular work on Darwin's finches, field assistants, collaborators, uh, we have many uh, um, uh, various projects, funding sources, and, and you. Thank you. There is one burning question before the coffee break. One. So, so a comment, um, thank, which goes back to your uh, uh, conic section slide. So, with each geometry, there's a notion. Plane geometry, there's a notion of curvature. So for Euclidean geometry, we have a Euclidean curvature, and that distinguishes circles and straight lines. In affine geometry, there's a notion of affine curvature, and the conic sections are distinguished by having constant affine curvature, just like circles have constant Euclidean curvature. So I don't know if this might play a role in why this is the sort of canonical form that has been settled on for, for these shapes. But given that the affine transformations seem to be underlying the shapes, it's interesting that you're singling out the constant curvature around these shapes. Yeah, it's a very interesting comment. Um, as a biologist, I would just comment myself that um, we understand this scaling type, the thesis type of variation, scaling variation, pretty well. So the molecules like they did before, diffusion based molecules, they seem to be controlling, again, to control the, kind of the amount of diffusible factor, you can control the scaling parameters fairly closely. What we don't understand so far is how you control shear. So that is something that you know, is, um, we have some ideas. But so I would advocate this as a way of understanding and quantifying shear. Yes. Right. Using using projective. Using affine geometry, technically. Yeah. Sort of intermediate between Euclidean and fully projective, which is, which is way too complicated in many cases. Right. Perhaps it's it's the simplicity of it that actually lends itself to this type of transformation. It's something that obviously Dr. Thompson picked up as well. In fact, he showed most of the examples that he shows in the book are on that exact type. Okay, on that note, let's break for coffee. <laughs> and reconvene in 15 minutes, 3.30 for the last part of the day. <laughs> No, it's a new weather and scales are done.